There is nothing like a college football rivalry game, and in week nine of the 2021 season, Michigan and Michigan State gave the viewers everything that they could have wanted. At the time, both teams were undefeated and ranked in the top 10, giving this matchup serious implications in the race for the Big Ten East and the national playoff hunt more broadly. And as if that's not enough, the game also featured a wild comeback as the Wolverines took a nine-point lead into halftime before the Spartans came roaring back for 23 points in the win in the second half. In this video, we're going to see how they did it. If you've been sleeping on the Spartans up until now, they currently have the leading rusher in the country in Kenneth Walker III, and this is a guy who jumps off the film in terms of opening up the offense, meaning that he makes plays even when they're not there for him schematically, and when they are there, he gets as much out of them as he possibly can. Both of those things were at work in the game against Michigan, as Walker rushed for almost 200 yards and a stunning five touchdowns. That means that Walker accounted for 30 of Michigan State's 37 points in this game, so we really need to start this video by talking about his performance before moving on to some second half passing game adjustments that also helped lead the Spartans to an instant classic come from behind win. Schematically, Michigan State doesn't do anything too fancy in the run game. They run a pretty straightforward zone rushing attack that sits somewhere in between a one-back pro style and a two-back spread offense, where the second back is really going to be a tight end playing an H-back kind of role. Early in the Michigan game, they tried to run the ball straight up this way without a lot of success, and we'll see what that looked like on this play. The blocking rules for a zone run can get a little bit complicated, but the key thing to know is that on a typical zone play, all of the offensive linemen are going to step in the direction of the play. As they step in that direction, if they encounter a first-level defender, then they're going to block him. If they don't encounter a first-level defender, then they're looking to combo block with the guy next to them, ideally creating a double team before one of them can slide off to get up to the second level. On this play, Michigan State's running zone to the left. As we can see right here, the left tackle, left guard, and center all have first-level defenders lined up either heads up over them or lined up to their left. And so according to the description that I just gave, they're all going to block those first-level threats. To the backside, the right guard doesn't have a defensive lineman to his left, and so on this play, he's going to look to help the center. As he steps left, he's going to create a double team on the center's man, trying to get him under control so that one of them can leave that block to take on a linebacker at the second level. So this is going to be a two-on-two -two block, working from the nose tackle up to that linebacker. On this play, that combo block is going to be where the run fails. If we keep an eye on the nose tackle lined up over the center, we see that that defender stays strong as the right guard comes across to double him, and he gives up very little displacement or push. Because the double team can't get that guy under control, neither of those blockers is able to leave that block, and so that linebacker at the second level is going to be totally free. As the play progresses, we see the running back try to cut back, but that linebacker is able to flow to the ball and step into that lane that he wants to take. Because that linebacker's unblocked, he's also going to be free to chase and get in on the tackle as the running back tries to cut it back even further to get away from him. This game wasn't all about that nose tackle eating up double teams, though, and an interesting feature of Michigan's strategy is that they often wanted to load up the line of scrimmage, playing with as many first-level defenders as possible in order to create a lot of one-on-ones for Michigan State's offensive line. For example, here on the first play of the game, they're playing a legitimate 6-1 front. So they've got these two edge players who look like outside linebackers but are actually defensive ends with each of them weighing in at 265 plus pounds. To the inside of those guys, they've then got four more defensive linemen. And we should notice here that Michigan State's offense isn't in a jumbo set or anything like that. They do have two tight ends on the field, but as we're seeing on this play, they regularly use that personnel grouping to get into spread alignments, so Michigan's heavy 6-1 front against this look is pretty unique to their defense. On this play, Michigan's in a nickel look, but we can see that here too, they're loading up the line of scrimmage and playing a bare front, putting a first-level defender over all five of Michigan State's offensive linemen. As we'll soon see, this is going to make it very hard, if not impossible, for Michigan State to double-team any of those guys, and Michigan's defensive line is going to thrive in the one-on-ones that this creates. On this play, the Spartans are running zone to the right, and so after the snap, all of their offensive linemen are going to step to the right and block any first-level defenders that show. That means that against this five-man defensive line, the center, right guard, and right tackle are all going to have first-level defenders lined up either heads up over them or to their right, and so they're going to have to block those guys. Now, in the last play, we saw that Michigan's nose tackle ate up a double team and caused a lot of problems. And here again, this backside offensive guard is going to try to work a double team to help out the center. And this is actually going to be really effective here. After the snap, we see that block get a pretty nice push, driving the nose tackle three yards off the line. Although that block was effective, though, let's look at what it does to this left tackle. With the left guard gone, that guy's going to be singled up on this defensive lineman who's shaded inside of him. After the snap, he won't be able to cross that guy's face and cut him off from the play. As the running back tries to break through the line, that defensive lineman is going to shed his block and get in on the tackle, holding it to a short gain. 
If we roll this back one more time, we can see that that guy isn't the only person responsible for blocking his man one-on-one, -on -one, and this really shows the benefits of Michigan's strategy. The Spartans do have that one double team on the nose tackle, but everybody else is singled up across the board. Michigan State's offensive line battled, and the Wolverines didn't win all of these matchups all of the time, but when you create this many one-on-ones, you radically increase the chances that at least one of those defenders will be able to win, and that was really the story of the first half. It's a testament to Walker's ability, then, that he was still able to rush for two touchdowns in this environment. On this play, for example, we see Michigan lined up in a 6-1 front, and Michigan State's trying to match strength with strength by bringing two tight ends into the backfield, putting them in a diamond formation. On this play, this defensive lineman at the top of the screen is going to be the guy that wins his one-on-one. -on -one. As we run the play forward a little bit, we're going to see him beat the left guard pretty handily, and we're going to see all of those other one-on-ones to the opposite side creating a big pile. Walker's going to run straight into all that traffic initially, but then he's going to be able to bounce off the pile for a second effort, taking this run 27 yards for a touchdown. This play wasn't a touchdown, but in some ways it was more impressive because here we're going to see how Walker's speed and athleticism could cause problems for Michigan's big personnel groupings. Here the Wolverines are running a 6-1 front, so this guy walked out on the edge here as a 265-pound defensive end that they're asking to play in space. After the snap, we're going to see Walker cut back toward that guy, but he's going to use his advantage in speed and agility to get across that defender's face and outflank him to the edge. Not content to just be the 265-pound defensive lineman, he's then going to shake the safety, breaking a tackle and getting to the sidelines for an extra 13 yards. Schematically, neither of these plays should have gone anywhere, but Walker was able to turn them both into big gains. As for the second half, I wouldn't say that Michigan State ever got into a rhythm in the run game. That might seem weird to say when Walker rushed for five touchdowns and 200 yards, but half of those yards came on just three plays, and otherwise it never felt like offensive coordinator Jay Johnson really had Michigan's number. That said, in the second half, he did get the Spartans into a few good calls, and from there, Walker was able to do the rest. We'll start with this play. Here, Michigan State's going light, playing with three wide receivers and one tight end who's lined out to the weak side of the formation. To match this light set, Michigan's playing nickel with a six-man box, and again here we see them putting five of those box defenders up at the first level, leaving them with just one linebacker stacked behind them. On this play, the Spartans are running zone to the left, and by now you know how this is going to work. So to the play side, the left tackle, left guard, and center all have defenders lined up over them, and so they'll have to block those guys. Now on a previous play, we saw the backside guard here working to help the center with a double team on the nose. We also saw that when he did that, it left the backside tackle singled up on a guy who was lined up inside of him, and he wasn't able to make that block. Well here, Michigan State's changing things up for those backside blockers with something called a fold block. That means that the guard, instead of working to his left to help the center, is going to fire out to block this backside defensive lineman. From his inside position, he's got a much better angle to cut that guy off from the play than the tackle, who's lined up to the outside of him. The tackle is then going to fold inside of that block, where he'll end up helping the center get the nose tackle under control, and this is going to open up a decent cutback lane for the running back in between those two blocks. In just a minute, we're going to take a look at another long touchdown run, but to set the scene for that, let's first check out this play from the first half. This is a short yardage play, and Michigan State has two tight ends on the field, with one lined up in the backfield as an H-back, and the other lined up in the slot down here at the bottom of the screen. Now, the reason that the Spartans are playing with a tight end in the slot like this is to set him up for a crack block on this edge player right here. So, after the snap, they're going to run an outside zone play to the left, and that slot tight end is going to block back, sealing off that defensive end and letting the running back get to the edge for a first down. That's the threat that the Spartans are presenting when they line up in this formation with the tight end split out wide. Now we're ready to look at another big touchdown play. This is another short yardage situation, and the offense is in that same two tight end set with one lined up in the backfield as an H-back, and the other split out wide in the slot. Now, to take away the threat of that crack block, the Wolverines are going to walk their edge player off the line of scrimmage, and we can see just after the snap that he's looking at that slot tight end preparing to play through the crack block. 
we can also see that before the snap, they're bringing this safety down to play outside of that tight end so that if he does crack back on the defensive end, that safety can set the edge and force everything back inside. So the Spartans aren't going to be able to get the edge here and everything should be forced back to the middle and to the strength of Michigan's defense. On this play, though, the Spartans have a trick up their sleeve and they're prepared to take advantage of that walked out edge player. Notice that before the snap, the ball's a little bit to the left of the middle of the field and that edge player is lined up almost on the far hash. Well, after the snap, that tight end in the backfield is going to fire out to kick that guy out. If we pause the play right here, we can see that this has widened that edge player even more. So when the tight end makes first contact with him, he's actually well outside the hash mark. As we can also see here, this has created an outside lane for the running back, and this is absolutely necessary because, again, we can see that on the inside, Michigan's won one of those one-on-one -on -one matchups. They've got a defensive lineman right here who's penetrated into the backfield and is completely free to pursue. Because of the wide point of attack on this play, though, Walker's able to outrace him to the edge, turning the corner and getting downfield for a 58-yard touchdown. To turn to the passing game now, Michigan State was efficient if not spectacular, and the main thing that they did really well was put pressure on Michigan's coverage to the sidelines. Michigan ran a good variety of coverages in this game, and things worked out differently depending on what coverage they were in, but in general, where the Spartans really excelled was in finding the soft spots when Michigan was in zone. Of course, this sounds like an obvious strategy. If the defense is going to go zone and play soft, then you'd hope that the offense could throw short, quick routes into the soft spots of those zones. But Michigan State was able to go one step further in doing a very nice job of creating those soft spots through their formations and route combinations. On this play, for example, they're using a stacked wide receiver alignment down here at the bottom of the screen to attack this off cornerback lined up over them. Michigan's running cover three here, and canonically that coverage would play with these three defenders deep, and then four defenders in underneath coverage. Michigan State's going to end up beating this coverage with a sail route to the outside receiver who's going to break outside into the sidelines, cutting underneath of that deep cover three cornerback. In this coverage, that corner is responsible for a deep outside third, and it's typically his job to stay over the top and keep everything in front of him. He can typically afford to play a little soft here because he should be getting underneath help from this nickelback at the bottom of the screen. In a typical cover three look, that guy's responsible for the short outside zone and underneath coverage, and when you combine that kind of drop with the cornerback over the top, you should end up with a nice high-low bracket on a route like this. Michigan State's route combination, though, is going to be designed to stop this from happening. To do this, they're going to take the other receiver in the stack and run him straight down the seam. The idea here is that if Michigan brackets the sail route, as I just described, that guy's going to be open in a lot of space in between the cornerback and the safety that's playing in the deep middle. Now, the Wolverines obviously don't want to allow this, and so instead of playing kind of an old-school cover three look like I outlined before, they're going to ask the nickelback to check that guy. For the most part, he's still defending that short outside zone, but the idea is that if his man does go vertical down the seam, then it's up to the nickelback to carry him. When he does this, however, it leaves the cornerback isolated, playing off of the sail route with no help underneath, and so the wide receiver is able to cut underneath of him for a nice gain to the sidelines. So, if you're getting beat underneath, then what do you do? Obviously, you get that cornerback up to the line of scrimmage and play a little soft press and take away that space, as we're going to see on this play. Here, Michigan State's running that same sail route, but if we look at this just after the snap, we see that the cornerback's playing tight and outside, so there's no way that the wide receiver is going to be able to beat him with an outside breaking route like this. The real key to this matchup in the passing game then, especially in the second half, was that Michigan State is really good at running a concept that's perfect for beating this kind of coverage, and that's called the slot fade. So here at the top of the screen, we again see that the cornerback is walked up to press the outside receiver. If we run this play forward just a little bit, what we see on this play is that the outside receiver is running a little hitch. Michigan's pressing here because they don't want to give up these quick throws underneath, and so the cornerback is going to stay with him. What this does, though, is it opens up the deep sidelines for the slot receiver, and on this play, he's running that slot fade that I mentioned. If we start this play over one more time from the beginning, we're going to see that guy take a hard outside release, crossing his defender's face and getting to the sideline. With that cornerback sitting shallow to take away the hitch, there's no help down the sidelines, and so the quarterback throws a nice ball to get the Spartans into the red zone. So what can you do if you want to take away both the quick stuff underneath and the fade to the slot receiver behind it? One option is to play cover two. 
In this coverage, a deep half safety will play over the top to take away the fade, leaving the cornerback free to stay underneath against the short stuff to the outside. Unfortunately for the Wolverines, Michigan State had a good concept in place to attack this coverage as well. If we look at Michigan's structure here, we see that they have that deep half safety over the top, that cornerback defending the flat, and then a nickelback lined up as the first defender to the inside. Well, to attack this, Michigan State's just going to split those two underneath defenders. First, the slot receiver is going to run inside to attack that nickelback, forcing him to come down inside with him. Next, the running back's going to leak out into the flat late, and that's going to force the cornerback to stay wide to avoid getting outflanked. So what does that do? Well, with the underneath coverage out of the way, this isolates the outside receiver on the deep half safety playing over the top. And so here, Michigan State's just going to have him run a little curl, again, taking advantage of that guy's deep coverage responsibility to pick up a nice gain underneath of him. Now, as I said, this passing game was efficient, if not dynamic. At times, the Spartans struggled to block Michigan's front defenders, and that explains a lot of why Michigan State threw for just a little under 200 yards in this game. They were generally ready for all the different coverage looks that Michigan could throw at them, though, and as a result, they were able to pick up enough key conversions to keep drives alive and to move down the field for points. All right, that's it for this video. I'll be breaking down games like this from across the country throughout the season, so be sure to keep checking back on the channel for more, and I'll see you here next time.